seems to fit because it, you, you, I mean, you see people slip into it, people who have been active and vital and something happens and very gradually you see them becoming, um, as you say, less present in, in each moment and yeah. more sort of trapped in some, some set of thoughts which have long since passed but they're, they're just going round and round in them. And, and, and I think in the book, you, you say that the, the difference between a rumination and a, and, and a memory is that the rumination doesn't have any action. It has no intent to change. Is right. that what you mean when you say that it's lost its vitality, that here you are remembering something, but not because you think, right, now I've remembered it, I'll do it differently. You'd never get to that last step. You're just, just remembering it. Right. It just becomes like, like a habit. Yeah, and, and you know there's even some data suggestive data um which i actually kind of plan on investigating a little bit more in, in the near future but about the networks in the brain that are involved in rumination because you, as you might imagine if you're ruminating you're kind of using the, a select network mostly you know related to these autobiographical memories in large part maybe tied to, to some negative feelings and you're just kind of going over those same networks, you know, those same pathways over and over again, where maybe other networks that you could engage in that require some kind of um, presence, concentration, you know, effort, whatever it is, those aren't being used either. Because you're, you know, you're back in these other kind of repetitive uh, networks. And so it gets back to something you said earlier, because it, it, as you said, it, you, when you run through those memories, you're also recreating the feeling. So if it's a negative memory, I presume that then you're going to recreate at least some echo of the negative feelings that were with them. And that's just to, to, to re constantly recreate a slightly negative feeling. I mean, that, I can't see how that helps at all. That, that in itself would make you depressed, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's why it's hard to know what causes what, right? Do ruminations cause depression? Does depression make you ruminate? I mean, they're so tightly connected. Um, one, of the, then, one of the sorry. things that I did talk about it a bit in the book, and I think it's also important to kind of think about is, um, so when you, have, when you bring back a memory from the past, obviously, um, you basically make another memory. So in the example of, of my uncle, I bring back this memory of my uncle who I loved and, and I'm bringing it back in this moment while I'm talking to you. Um, and now I've made more memories of him because he's tied now to this moment. And in, in memory research, you know, we call that like either updating the memory or editing it. But in essence, basically you're making more of these associations with that, with that memory. So if you think about it in terms of rumination, that's also happening. Because when you're ruminating, you know, you're bringing back these memories, again, most of them negative, with some feelings that are usually negative too. And now you're still making yet, you know, more of these memories. Right, so it starts to colonize you in a way. You, you, yeah. Right, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So by doing that, you're just, you're, you're filling your mind up with, yeah, copies I mean, of copies of copies of the, of the original negative. Right. Okay. Yeah, physically, I think it's really good for people to realize there's a there's a physical manifestation of a memory. You know, it's not like it. It's there. It's in your brain, and sometimes even if you can't necessarily uh, access it, it's it's there somewhere. And so, yeah, the idea that you're making more of them means that they're actually there, you know, somewhere in your brain. Yes, and and th that notion, as you say, that the physicality the, uh, of how memories are made and how they is key to what you then go on to suggest is a way forward for people. Because um, you know you, you talk about that we do create the possibility of new memories through changes, cellular changes in the, the part of the brain, the hippocampus, so that you know you and you you relate it to um concentrating and, and and thinking about things that the mind is ready to learn as you put it isn't it because it's it physically is in the neurons making little 
connect little explorations ready to connect with another neuron yeah it want it, i don't know wants maybe that's too <laughs> but i mean it is set up for learning it's always learning and and sometimes i think people also use the word learning very select selectively so they think oh i learn in school right or i you know i study learning in the laboratory but but in reality we're always learning even if we're learning not to respond you know, so in the case of, of, of depression, for example, or even, even responses to trauma, many people avoid life, right? They start to avoid situations that remind them of what happened, or in the case of depression, they just don't want to interact. And so they're, they're learning to avoid life. And, and as a consequence, then it kind of it's kind of a, a vicious circle to some extent because the less you interact with the world, the less stimulation your brain is getting, the less likely you're going to learn mm -hmm. to want more, you know, to want to learn more because it's safe. It's, you know, feels safer to kind of, to kind of shut down and, and avoid what could be frightening. But to some extent, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's making things worse. Actually. Yes, because if I've understood what you've been arguing, what you'll be left with is just the repetitive echo of whatever it was that, that made you want to withdraw from the world in the first place. So there's nothing else to go on, is there? Just that, to run it over and over. Yeah. Okay. Now, you, what was, what's not interesting about the book is you, 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 you run through the examples of what the problem is and you talk about how the how the, the mind, the brain does actually learn. And then you come up with a surprisingly concrete suggestion for how you can tackle this. Because as you, you know, and, and it is, it all hinges on this connection with the brain and the body that we've talked about already, that you have a thought, you have a memory, which is obviously up here, but it intimately connected with the body because it, it recalls a feeling because there's a lovely bit in the book where you say look you have a memory but it's what makes a traumatic memory traumatic is is the f awful feelings that come with it and they don't come from your brain they come from your body and that was such a nice mm -hmm. thing to suddenly make the reader sit back and go oh yes and that is imp important isn't it yeah it is very important and it becomes very important for how to tackle it so, I mean, tell us about the, this, you know, the, the um, program that you've suggested, because it does combine the, the sort of exercising, you know, an aspect of doing something with the body and something to do with the mind. And it's very clear and simple and concrete. So do you mind telling us a little bit about it? Yeah, sure. I'd like to. Um, so this program, I call it a brain fitness program. It's not really a therapy per se, but um, it's called MAP training. So men MAP stands for mental and physical. Um, you know, it took me a long time to kind of hone in on what would be the most useful activities. Having, you know, studied a lot of aspects of stress and trauma and learning and I, I really did look at everything that would be possible. And there are a few things that kind of came out as being really useful for people. Um, one of them is meditation. So the, the, the MAP or the M in MAP stands for mental training, which is in this program, meditation. And then the physical part is uh, aerobic exercise. Now, both of those activities um, are really good for the brain. I and mean, there's other things that are good for the brain. I was thinking about this last night, you know, like taking a walk. Well, that's probably good for the brain or going seeing a friend is good for the brain, I suppose. It's hard to study those things, but um, these activities are effortful. You know, they require concentration. They require effort. So, what I didn't want to do is propose some kind of, you know, intervention or brain fitness program that was just kind of more of the same, more of the kind of like eat well, sleep well, and then you'll be happy. Like we've seen a lot of that, right? <laughs> yes. And it's, 
it's fine. I'm not, you know, saying it doesn't, it isn't good to do that, but I wanted something more specific. And, and meditation came to me. I actually not, I was not a person into meditation. In fact, I thought it was probably too soft really for me. And, but a friend of mine, when I was thinking about devising this program suggested it. And I was like, well, I shouldn't really say negative things about it. I've never done it. And so I went to do it actually at a, at a group uh, at Rutgers University and they were in the basement of some building sitting in complete silence for hours. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so hard. <laughs> like it's really hard to do that. And, but interesting, you know, really interesting because you realize when you meditate in complete silence, particularly with other people, but even by yourself, how distracted your brain is, how it wants to run off and ruminate and bring up memories and think about the future and how hard it really is to concentrate on this moment. So I became kind of a, a believer, I guess you could say, in meditation. Certainly, I agree that it's a form of mental training. It's, it's really uh, difficult to do. Um, and then it's 30 minutes of meditation, 20 minutes just sitting, 10 minutes of slow walking, which is kind of similar in principle. You just walk really slowly. And when your mind starts to wander, you bring your attention back into your, to your feet. And then we immediately follow it with 30 minutes of aerobic exercise, meaning oxygen. Aerobic means oxygen. So in order to get oxygen going in your body and in your brain, you need to get your heart rate up. Um, and sometimes people don't know this, but the brain uses like 20% of the oxygen that you breathe in goes to your brain, even though the brain only weighs, you know, a couple percentages of the body of your total body weight. So the, the brain loves oxygen. It needs it. It needs it to, to create memories, thoughts, feelings, the whole, you know, shebang. And that's associated with a fast heart rate. So in this practice, what's happening is the heart is very slow during the meditation, right? Your heart is beating very slow generally. And maybe you're bringing up thoughts about the past, traumatic memories, whatever, that would normally cause your heart rate to increase. But now you associate these memories or thoughts with the relaxed state. Then you immediately go into this aerobic state where your heart is beating really fast. Again, something you often associate with fear and, and trauma. But now maybe you're, I don't know, having fun or certainly exerting yourself and not thinking about the past because you can't really if you're really aerobically exercising. So yeah, it's, I think it really helps people partly because of that, because you're learning to, to dissociate, you know, a beating heart that you have with fear from fear mm -hmm. and the, you know, calmness that you might associate with being, you know, sleepy or tired or depressed now with actually, you know, learning something about mm -hmm. your, your own brain. But then there's also a, a sort of a, a, a deeper, more um, uh, scientific part of it. I mean, based on the cell, the work that you've, a lot of the work you've done, because um, when you're engaging in the mental activity, the, 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 the um, meditation, the, there is a physical change that happens in that the, the, the cells that um, allow us to encode memories in the hippocampus, they do start to put out more um spines i think you called them so in other words yes you will get an meditation or any kind of difficult mental work is going to tell the um, cause your mind your brain to say right we're going to have to do some learn some learning here and it starts to physically do that doesn't it the neurons start to say right we need to reach out to each other and make a new pattern because trace is making us learn something yes but then, and this was the lovely bit, you said, yeah, but when you do those studies, um, not all of those cells 
or the, those new connections will survive and not even and new brain cells that may come into being, they won't survive. Um, so when you, when you take, when you're getting, doing all the exercise, that increases the oxygen and that creates the, the, the cells being created. Is that right? So just the physical business of doing stuff, but then how many of them survive these new connections depends on the meditation. Have I got that the right way around? Um, yes. It's, you know, it's a little hard to know in, in humans, yeah, you know, I think it, sometimes yeah. in, in, um, when people talk about the brain, sometimes they don't always realize the limitations that we have as neuroscientists. So we can't really count cells in a human, you know, while they're doing something. <laughs> it's just impossible. So, I mean, all the studies that are done in humans are usually post-mortem, meaning after someone has died, they donate their brain and then, you know, and obviously the cells are no longer alive. And so there's limitations there. And so most of the these kind of conclusions are kind of um, translated basically from these kind of animal models, typically rats and mice. Mm. But yeah, in the 1990s, late, well, mid to late 90s, there was this discovery that I was, you know, somewhat involved in um, at just, there was a, a person, her name's Elizabeth Gould and she's a neuroscientist and she was a friend of mine is a friend of mine, and she had discovered these that new neurons were generated in a part of the brain known as the hippocampus. And that was quite a, you know, it was a pretty shocking discovery because up until that point, we didn't think that the brain really made new neurons. Um, and we subsequently did some studies showing that, that they're involved in learning. So they certainly didn't think, you know, new neurons would be involved uh, in learning. Now, there is controversy to some extent still about how many of these new neurons are made in humans. And, you know, can we take what's, what we know about them in a laboratory mouse and a rat and then apply it to people? But um, I think it's pretty safe to say that these cells are very responsive to our environment. They're very responsive to learning, and they're certainly very responsive to exercise, aerobic exercise. So if you put a, a mouse in a running wheel or a rat, they'll run. They love to run, not like humans. They just love it. <laughs> they love to exercise, and they will make more of these cells in their hippocampus. Just automatically? Yeah. Hmm. And there's some studies in humans that kind of approach that. They had people run on treadmills um, who don't normally exercise and they found more blood flow into that region of the hippocampus. So there's some you know, indirect evidence that it would happen in humans too. But then once the cells are there, and this is the part of the studies that I was involved in, once the cells are, are born or generated, then a lot of them die. So if you go back and look two, three weeks later after they're born, a lot of them are, are gone. Right. Which may kind of explain why we didn't see them always, right, to begin mm -hmm. with. But what we determined is if, if, in this case, rats learn something new that's effortful, that requires concentration, then the cells survive. Right. So that's, that's the, the connection between the aerobic exercise and the mental activity. One exactly. gives you this, the sheer energy, the sheer, you know, sugar coursing through your head and, and, and oxygen allowing you to burn it all and build stuff and create new cells and new connections. So your, 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 your brain is ready to learn. Physically, you've got it to the point where it's got everything it needs to learn. But if it doesn't, if you, if you are not then presented with something to learn, then it's like calling the fire brigade and nothing happens. They just go back in again. You go, oh, yeah. well, never mind. <laughs> yeah it's like it's use it or lose it right yes which is one of the chapters in the book so yeah. so so that's why you've got the two parts yeah. you know the, the the physical activity the mental activity because you want people to be primed and ready to learn something new something that's not depressive and not just ruminating you know not just making a copy of something negative but and 
and then the, the mental exercise means that it's this new thought is going to survive it's going to it's going to be printed over the top of all those negative memories yeah yeah it has a substrate you know like because if you think about it in a physical sense you have to have a substrate hmm. you know you have to bring in the equipment so then you can use the equipment and if it's the equipment's not there then you know so you can imagine um you know people often ask me what they can do to, to change their brain. And first of all, the brain's always changing. So pretty much anything you do will, will change your brain. But I think what's important when you, when you really think about these kind of practices and these kind of ideas is that they're sustained over time. Hmm. Because, you know, just going out and running, like if I go out and run around the block a few times right after this uh, interview, you know, am I gonna make that many new neurons? <laughs> Probably not. Like it needs to be a part of, of your life. You know, it has to be enough to overcome maybe what you haven't been doing. You know, I hear a lot of people, particularly about the pandemic, talking about, you know, how isolated they become and, and depressed, really sad and, and isolated and lonely. And, and, and the data bear that out. You know, there's a lot of studies now showing a lot of depression and anxiety in, in people and, and trauma-related symptoms. And part of the problem is that it's been going on for so long. Hmm. You know, so if this had happened over the course of a week or a month, okay, fine. We could probably easily kind of bounce back and recover. But when you're talking months and years, that's a lot of downtime for the brain you know that's a lot of hmm. loss of substrate in a way and so to overcome that yeah you really have to put in like it's hard it's hard to it one of the things that i found the most difficult you know now that i try to get people to do these activities is they'll do it for a little while but then after a few weeks they're like oh no i'm not doing it anymore it's too hard <laughs> You know, so that's, that's, that's the hard part is making yourself do it, even though, you know, you will feel better. 